I ran over to the copier to get a copy of the contract in this ring filled up quick. Let me see if I can find Murray Coleman, my guest. All right, promote panelists. I didn't even get a chance to fix my lipstick. I hope I'm okay. Oh, Murray, come on in. I'm gonna go ahead and put us live on Facebook. I'm gonna to try to put us live on Facebook. Hey there, Murray. Okay, I'm good. How are you? Let me just get my screen set up here. I okay. had to move from my normal location. Yeah, I got up to grab something off the printer. We had two guests and then I came back three seconds later and we had 18. So I thought <laughs> that was a good sign. So welcome everybody that's in here. Uh, uh, I'm just getting us ready to go live on Facebook. Yep. This morning it didn't work for me, so I'm hoping whatever glitch they had is fixed. Oh, and it's not. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, we do this, we do this really fun thing here in the mornings, Murray. In case you've never seen the Reedy and Red show. Have you ever seen the Reedy and Red show? I have watched some of it, yeah. Okay, well, when all else fails. We go with the red cam. You want to know what the red cam is? No, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know if you want to know? I don't know. It's scary. Oh, shucks. The thing isn't going to cradle it that way. Um, whew, well, the red cam is my phone because it's red. And it's how we go live on Facebook when Zoom will not connect. And we're going to go live on Facebook, even though Zoom won't connect, and it's just going to look ugly, but that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll try it out anyways. It's a lunch and learn. When life gives you lemons, we just make lemonade, right? Exactly right. All right, guys, give me just another second, I'm trying to figure out where, I, there's my create a post. Go live. I want to be able to do it this way. Um, oh, I know how to do it. I'm sorry. I just had my conversation with my dog. I always do before a Zoom call to tell him not to bark. Oh, well, that's smart. Um, yeah, I'll really, never takes any notice, especially if the UPS guy arrives. <laughs> Or the Amazon guy. Oh God, yeah, this house is like a Amazon distribution center here. Oh. I'm working on it. Sorry, everybody who's out there watching. Um. Ooh, someone said I look great. I think they're talking about you. Oh, I might have said something about lipstick. Did you put your lipstick on beforehand? No. Uh, I, I powder my head to stop the glare. Well, we all have our techniques, don't we? Okay, this is, this is going to drive me insane. All right, got that piece done. <laughs> oh, 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 maybe this works. No, there we go. There we go. We're almost there, Murray. We're almost, we're almost there. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go live this way. I think we're good enough. You know what it's saying to me? It said bad connection. But you ready, Murray? Or are you waiting for the UPS guy to come in? Never been, never been ready yet. All right, well, let's do a real quick introduction of what we're doing here. So everybody who's out there live on Facebook uh, with the Reedy and Red Cam or uh, maybe with um, on Zoom, you've got myself, Rachel Sartain, and Murray Coleman here. So Murray, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Oh, great. That's uh, my favorite subject. 
So um, <laughs> the uh, I'm Murray Coleman, I'm a uh, Keller Williams broker. I broker nine uh, Keller Williams offices and I'm the uh, consulting broker to the Chadwick group and a couple of other groups around the state. So um, there's uh, no real mystery to me. Um, I've got a couple of stats uh, that I'm going to share with you um, and why uh, we think that the market's hot and, and how we end. I'm just grabbing my sheet here. Um, I had to do a presentation yesterday and uh, one, one of the stats that they wanted was uh, the number of sales and transactions that we oversee. Um, and in, in 12 months to date, um, under the offices that we take care of, and I say we, um, I have a couple of uh, three or four compliance officers that work for me, and then I partner with Sally Wagner, who um, is a, a real estate attorney and uh, helps us out. And in the last uh, 12 months, we've done uh, $4.1 billion in sales, um, not us personally, but uh, under the brokerages, and that amounts to 13,588 transactions. And if you want to put that into some kind of perspective, um, that is four times the amount that EXP uh, do in North and Central Florida. So uh, that's a pretty, I would think it's a pretty impressive uh, amount of transactions. And the reason I say that is because we, we become like emergency room doctors. We see so much that comes across our desk every day between 20 and 30 calls a day on a, on a reasonable day, uh, that we get to see all the problems that come about and then are able to offer solutions to those problems and, and some training around them. So, so that's it, that's me. Okay. In a nutshell. In a nutshell. Um, well, you know, I, I think it's important, the statistics you just gave to re, uh, reemphasize that that's for nine real Keller Williams offices. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay. So, and just for you guys to know, I do have, um, we, we do have the chat box up. So if you have questions, you can please put them in the chat box. Everybody's saying hi to you, Murray, because they love when Murray Coleman answers the phone and is able to help them. It's that beautiful accent that he has. <laughs> if you are on Facebook Live, I apologize for the quality of this, but uh, we do what we can. And uh, if you have questions, please interact. Um, when you have a question, I can guarantee somebody else is thinking the same question. Uh, they just might not be asking it. And that's what we want to do here is we want to um, help you guys um, with understanding this at a higher level. So myself, uh, my name is Rachel Sartain. I've been in real estate. I'm a real estate license back in 2002, started practicing in 2003 in uh, St. Pete. I actually come from a real estate family in Tennessee. Watching my aunt sell real estate, I always vowed that I would never sell real estate because she was constantly on the phone. It was before cell phones. It was when they had those really long cords that would wrap all the way around the house. Um, but I did get my uh, real estate license when I was in uh, grad school and uh, for invasive plant species, not for real estate. Um, but and then in 2009, joined Keller Williams as um, as a broker to help um, launch one of our offices. And uh, it's been 11 years ago this past week, Murray, was my anniversary. So that was uh, How long have you been with Keller Williams? Uh, 2007, 13 years. Okay, okay, wonderful. Um, and recently I uh, started as the managing broker for three of our offices. So St. Pete, Seminole, and Gulf Beaches definitely would not be able to do that with the support of Murray Coleman and his resources and our amazing leadership team. Super excited to have this contract class today because we're going to take a little different spin on it. Uh, Murray and I've talked about this. You know, going line by line from the contract, we know that all of you guys have a real estate license, which tells me you know how to read. Right, Mari? You think Hopefully. they know how to read? <laughs> yeah, <I do. laughs> so we're, do. Not, we're not going to go line by line in the contract. What we're going to talk about are there are two contracts that are um, typically used in Pinellas County and Tampa Bay. We're not going to go over the Chris contract. I know that's one that is more commonly used over in... Um, in Southern Tampa, Hillsborough County. Um, but we're gonna be talking about the FAR Bar residential contract for sale and purchase, and then the as-is contract. Um, and just 
a little background on these two. So when I got into real estate, uh, started practicing in 2003, what I refer to as the standard contract is the residential contract for sale and purchase. It's not the as is. And so when I got started in real estate, it was the one that almost everybody used. The only people that used the as is contract were in, um, investors or people who were really buying a property as is. And so by, by offering to purchase it as is, they were getting the price lower because the seller knew they, they weren't going to have any obligations or any repairs. The as-is contract became very popular in the Great uh, Recession with um, short sales and foreclosures because we knew that if the seller couldn't pay their mortgage, they weren't, they weren't going to pay to turn the utilities on and they weren't able to pay for repairs. So, and, and we also knew that the banks who had foreclosed or were managing the properties we're not going to be able to do those repairs either. So we started using the as is when 60% uh, when of our transactions were either foreclosures or short sales. Somehow over the years, Murray, and maybe you can shed some light on this because I'm not sure why, but somehow over the years, we've just bastardized the as is contract and use it on everything for everyone, thinking that is the best contract for all transactions and the knowledge of the standard residential sales and purchase agreement has just kind of disappeared. So many realtors that you come across have never even heard of the contract, don't know how to use it, haven't seen it. And it can be scary if you, if you don't understand the contract, but yet it has so many great benefits for both the buyer and the seller and for you as the realtor. So um, Amari, did, did I give a pretty good history lesson there? Did you have a different perspective of that? No, that, that was spot on. I think the one thing that I would add is I think a reason it doesn't get used is just the lack of knowledge out there in, in the real estate community about how that standard form works. And also, um, the other reason I would say Oh, the other big point I want to make is, and it comes up now and again in, in legal cases, is are we really doing our job when we don't inform our parties that there are, are, is more than one contract? So when you're working with a buyer, if they don't know about the standard form contract, that's a bad thing. Um, I think it would be a good, it, it would be good practice for every agent to explain to their buyer and their seller that there are two different types of contracts and let them make the decision as to what they want to use. And that takes that off your back. The other thing is, of course, um, a, lot of a lot of listing agents will put it in MLS that they only want the as-is contract. Yeah, so, so when you see it in the, in the and I, I love that you brought that up because that's something that's commonly asked. Well, what about if it says it in the MLS that I'll only use the as-is? So when you see that in the MLS, um, in the realtor remarks, uh, please present all offers on the as-is contract, what, is, what does that make you think? Me? Yes, you. Yeah, me. Um, it's just they don't know how to use a standard form, or the seller is not going to do any repairs, or um, they, uh, yeah, I think maybe it's just they're just lazy. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's obviously my thought, first thought, too, is that they, they just don't know what it is, and they haven't taken the time. And so the purpose of us doing this class and opening it up to all realtors and all brokerages and across the Tampa Bay area and whoever might be watching on uh, Radio Red Live is that we just want to offer information so you can sharpen your skills and be the best professional out in the street. And right now, with the competitive buyer market that we're in, we're seeing um, from statistics I've seen that were published for the end of 2019 from uh, the uh, department head of Freddie Mac showed that for every one home, there were three buyers, meaning con for construction starts and the amount of housing that we have. So just think about that. For every one home, we have three buyers. So when you guys are going out and you're experiencing multiple offer situations, it's extremely important that you know that you have all the tools in your toolbox to be able to make your offer look the best. And on the listing side of that, what we're also seeing is last week, in the last seven days, uh, Pinellas Realtor Organization statistics showed that in the Tampa Bay area, there were 196 
homes that got put on the market, 196 active listings in a seven day period in all of Tampa Bay. It also showed that 75 went back on the market. So what that says to me is there are a lot of buyers scrambling to get the property under contract just to have something under contract um, and or just to hold it and then they're canceling afterwards. If you're on the listing side of that transaction and your seller it has a contingency on the, on the sale of their home to purchase another home, if they're moving out of state, if they have six offers uh, that are strong and you've just taken an offer that's as is and then the buyer wakes up the next morning with cold feet or they think they found something better, you're giving them the ability to just cancel the contract. So what, what Murray and I are gonna do today is we're gonna go through the residential contract for sale and purchase. It is the revised um, June 2019 um, contract that you can, uh, you can find on your Florida Realtors site. And we're gonna talk about the key differences between the two contracts and when to use which one and how to present both so that you are making, you're helping your buyer and seller make the best informed decision. And we always have to remember, Murray, that in real estate, we're not a party to the transaction. It is about the buyer and it's about the seller. And it is our job as transaction agents to do the best thing for that transaction. Amen. Okay, Beth, we are not going to be talking about the crisp. I apologize. We're just going to be looking at these two today. We probably should bring, um, and let's see, what, which Beth is this? Beth, can you throw out your last name, please? I'm, see, I'm reading Zoom chats over here. Beth, Beth, Beth. Okay, and Beth, which area are you in? Are you in the Brandon area? Because the Brandon and Apollo Beach areas and uh, down into Bradenton, we're seeing the crisp contract used quite often. Uh, you're in Seminole, okay. That's right, Beth, you are in Seminole. <laughs> yeah, um, so that's interesting to know, Beth. Um, you know, I would love your feedback. Are you seeing the crisp contract in Pinellas County or are you doing a lot of sales in the Bradenton, um, Apollo Beach, Brandon area where we do see these? And um, Murray, maybe we can get you to do a contract class with um, one of our other partners over in that area so that we can bring the crisp information out. Um, okay, so Murray, you told me that you had a document that helps people navigate through the differences. Yeah, I emailed you this morning, so maybe you can distribute it out um, to your folks. But uh, when I when I get the opportunity to work with different teams um, and groups, one of the things they uh, that I really focus on is the amount of transactions that they have fall through during the inspection period. So if they're a listing listing agent, um, then you have. Uh, you know, maybe three or four buyers have gone through and then cancelled after four or five days. So your, your property's been off the market for 20 days due to those as-is fall-throughs. And when you actually look at the statistics, we've had some, some listings that have been off the market for 60 days just because they've been through two or three uh, uh, inspections. So we try and get them to move towards using the standard form contract. And, um, and I think there's a little confusion of which contract we're, we're, do, we're doing. I just want to make sure we're clear that the Farbar 5 contract comes in two versions. One standard and one is as is. And it, it, the CRISP is a completely different contract. It stands for the um, contract for residential sale and purchase. Unlike this one, which is the other one, um, which I can't remember the name of. Uh, the, uh, far, the Farbar five and the five bar five as is, is what we're talking about. So yeah, so what, I, what the problem I was running into was these listing agents would say things like, well, it's great that we have the standard form and we like to use it, but unfortunately the buyer's agent on the other side, when we say we want this on a standard form contract, they don't understand the contract. So I created a little packet um, which gives instructions to the co broke agent um, when it's our listing and we do it in a very um, non-confrontational way and, and, it, and I'll just read you the opening paragraph so that it, it, uh, you, you'll see what, the, what we're doing. We say things like, uh, this is not intended to be broker advice and you should always consult your own broker. This is going to the buyer's agent. 
This information is offered to our own buyer's agents and you are welcome to use it if you think fit. Now I've made a couple of calls to Cobrokes on the other side and said, hey, how did you receive that information? And they said it was great. Now we're not accusing them of being silly. You know, we're not accusing them of not having knowledge. We're saying, hey, this is what our buyer's agents use. You'll feel free to use it. And then, and then the document just has a step-by-step -step guide of what they should expect as they go through the transaction. And what that does is it eliminates the craziness where they just arbitrarily will cancel during the inspection period, or they'll get Uncle Bill to come and do the inspection, and all the crazy stuff that happens um, in, in, the, uh, in the transaction that an, 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 a person who's not familiar with the, with the contract would do. You know, Murray, it just reminds me of a story that uh, Jennifer Orns always tells uh, because so when we use the as is contract, guys, we're eliminating all the language about repairs being done by an appropriately licensed person, the time frame of repairs, receipt of repair and warranty, permitting, all of that stuff. We've eliminated it all because it's as is. So when you guys go into an as is contract, please go in with that mindset. Like, if, if when I die, not, nothing more is put on my tombstone <laughs> and that I helped realtors understand how to use the other contract, I would be, I would be a very happy person. Uh, and when I say that the as is has been bastardized, like there is not an inspection, uh, there's not a repair clause in there. So every time we use the as is contract and ask for repairs, that's what when we're bastardizing it. That's not what it should be used for. It is an as is contract, as is, where is. It's, and so you need to have that conversation with your buyers when you go into the contract. What ends up happening is realtors ask for repairs and then the repair addendum isn't properly written. Um, so is it done by an appropriately licensed person? Are permits pulled where needed? And what time frame do the uh, repairs need to be done? And are receipts given? And so Jennifer Orange shares a story about the, um, the seller needing to like caulk some cracks in the stucco or something of a house and um, on an as-is contract and literally use toothpaste to do it. Toothpaste. Now, it, it, I mean, if all the as is, if all the addendum said was that the seller will caught the, the stucco cracks, okay then. But we also know that in the standard contract under the general repair items, cracks in stucco might not actually need to be repaired. So that could concern some people. So Murray, why don't we just jump into, uh, we're gonna, if you guys uh, are okay with it, I'd like to just jump right over to page three of 13 of your sales agreement, which is paragraph nine, where the major changes or major differences between the two contracts exist. Unless Murray, there's something prior to that that you would like to point out. No, um, I just I just go back to, I uh, just wanna talk about that handout. And, and um, once you, once people, get this uh, packet. Uh, there's actually, I just want to get, say this so that they're not thinking as we're going through this, uh, taking unnecessary notes, but um, there's, there's a, a, a memo to the buyer's agent. There's a memo to the inspector. Um, so this is the notice to the Cobra. Uh, I put my email address in the, um, in the chat box on Zoom. So if you guys want this email to you, please just send me an email um, and put contract packet in the um, subject line and I'll get this over to you. So this is the notice to the co-broke. And then there is a notice uh, to the buyer, to our buyer. Anything specific you want to point out in here? No, just remember, you know, we always talk about a consultant attorney. We don't want to be giving them legal advice, but we're giving, we're talking in general terms about the standard contract and then, um, you know, a timeline, you know, judges have said in cases that the S the agent's supposed to keep a note of times, but the buyer has a responsibility to, to make sure that they're within their time limits. And so, you know, cases have been thrown out, not because, the, buy, the buyer's agent didn't keep uh, track of the time. Also, the buyer didn't keep track of time. 
So it's important that they do have some knowledge. Yeah, I know you want to put your arm around them and say, let me take you on this journey. Don't worry about anything. I'll see you at the closing table. But they do need to understand the contract. So I love this because um, I saw, I overheard an agent in the office the other day um, meeting with a buyer, doing a consultation. And, you know, understanding people's behavior style is so important. Um, so with that, they, um, you could tell that these people were probably a little bit more diligent in reading documents, having additional inspections, et cetera. In order to um, facilitate that transaction or to have them prepared, is it important to go ahead and send them over both agreements to review before ever trying to get them to sign a contract? So this, this document here just explains, hey, these are the two contracts that we have. These are the differences. Go ahead and review them. And then we can decide which one we're going to use um, when we find a property. And doing this ahead of time is essential, especially in this market, when we might have three, four, five, six offers on a property. You need your buyer to be ready, willing, and able. Um, there, you have some additional sheets in here that we'll come back to as we get closer yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna stop share and we're back up. So on paragraph nine of the standard sales and purchase agreement under closing cost fees and charges, this is where we start to see the major differences between the as-is contract and the standard contract. Uh, Rhonda Senator for here on Facebook and she says that they use the as-is and Rhonda, so I'm just gonna ask you if you're still out there, is there a reason, a specific reason why, why you use the as-is contract? Um, so if you could type that in there. And hey guys, if you're putting your email address in the chat room, I might not get it. So please email me based off of my email address uh, with, the, with the comment of um, the contract packet and I'll get that over to you. I don't know if there's a way to save the chat box. Uh, notes, so I might miss them, and I don't want you guys to miss out. Um, so we are looking at the um, the closing costs, and you know, Murray, I don't have the contract that I can just pull up and share. I probably should have done that. It's oh. almost, it's like, yeah, it would be okay, but I don't think it's essential. Does everyone have one with them? So R Rhonda says that they do use it consistently. And so Rhonda, I was just asking, what, what is important to you about using the as is versus the standard agreement? And I know Rhonda's been uh, in real estate for almost as long as I have been. So I know that she's had experience with both contracts. So I'd I want to know the difference. Um, so Murray, in paragraph eight, nine A, we're talking about closing costs to the seller and here, you know, the, the standard ones are going to be your doc stamps, owner policy and charges, title search, municipal lien search, HOA, recording fees, seller attorney fees, and other. And while we're here with this other, guys, you make sure that when you receive an offer, you review it very carefully. That little other line, people will type things in there, like 6% of the purchase price towards the buyer's closing costs. And when it's typed in there, it's sometimes overlooked. So always make sure you're looking at line 134 of your contract. Um, but then we got these three lines, Murray, that um, are kind of confusing. So why, why don't you tell us about it? Okay, so 136, 138, and 140, uh, you'll notice there's an asterisk um, by in, this, in the left-hand column or right-hand column, whatever it is. Uh, um, it depends which, site, which country you're from. I do. So it says here, up to the seller will pay the following amounts or percentages of the purchase price for the following costs or repairs. And then it gives a dollar symbol, which means you know, they want a dollar amount in there, or they give you an opportunity to put a percentage. Um, my advice is to always put something in there, although it says left blank, 1.5% is a very high number if it's a very high uh, cost property. And those 1.5% for general repair items, which we're gonna talk about what an actual general repair item is later as we dig into the contract, um, up to 1.5% if left blank for WDO treatment and repairs, which remember that it's not just treatment, it's repairs of damage caused by WDOs. And they actually uh, define what a WDO is later in the contract. And I remember you know, back, even 
years ago when I first went through real estate school, uh, they taught this and I just remember, the only thing I remember from that class was the fact that a post hole beetle is a WDO and, and then it comes back again to haunt me in this, this contract. Uh, I've never met a post hole beetle um, and I'm most probably inspectors do all the time, but I wouldn't even know what one looks like. And then on line 140, this is the one I absolutely love. And this is, if, if for nothing else, this contract is perfect because the, the as-is contract has no protection at all for the buyer for unpermitted improvements and expired permits or, any, or um, open permits. But this contract ties up the seller to get these things closed out, which the as-is doesn't. It, all it does is make the seller disclose them and assist the buyer, but the buyer bears all the costs. So. Yeah, and, and Rhonda put in here, Rhonda, thanks so much for participating on Facebook. Rhonda said that um, they like to use the as is because not everything is obvious and blatant that will need to be repaired. How can you determine cost of potential repairs without estimates or even knowledge of the, what needs to be repaired? And I so appreciate right. that, Rhonda, and that's exactly why we're going through this is all of those things are become transparent and a process in the standard contract. Whereas in the as is contract, it's just like wild, wild west in my world. Right. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, and and, and we, that is one of the most commonly asked questions. Now, how do you know how much to ask for? Now, the, the, my standard response is ask for the 1.5%. Or, no, or you can ask more. You know, let's just say you've, you've presumably you've been to the house Presumably you have a fair idea of how well it's been maintained. You were there and the AC was most probably running. Uh, you turned lights on and you can tell generally what a house is like. If you're in a multiple offer situation, you're going to decide maybe you're not going to ask for as many repairs. You're going to, it depends on whether your buyer is handy or not, or what their budget is. If, if, if you're dealing with a, a person who has, they're buying their first home, and they don't own a screwdriver or a, a putty knife, you know, that there's most probably they're going to want a lot of the groundwork done. So, so just, um, you know, do you, obviously they're going to make the decision and you're going to make the decision on how much based on the popularity of the property that you're making the offer on, but it can always be countered. Yeah. So if you ask for the sky, the seller can always come back and say, look, we're prepared to do two grand's worth of work. Brad, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, it was Barb Dagan. Thank you, Barb. Put in a great comment on Zoom. She said you can always add addendum L just in case your estimates are too low. So what addendum L does is it says it's the right to inspect the property, get your repairs back, and determine is this a home that the buyer wants to continue forward with. And if it's not, they can cancel during that inspection period. If they don't choose to cancel, they can now ask for repairs and everything is covered within this contract. So by using Addendum L, it's like the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. you know, what, when I teach this class in other areas, um, I always use St. Pete as an example. We had a, and I can't remember who it was. I want to say it was my friend, Eric, um, but we had a downtown building that a young lady was buying and it was an ancient building, you know, one of your historic type things. And she used the standard contract and it, it I think it was a two grand limit. The repairs came back at 14,000. And we'll talk about this out later on about what, but it was just amazing that the seller turned around and said, yeah, I'll fix it. Well, right. And that, and so, uh, so let's go into this. So I'm working with a buyer or I am a buyer. I go into this beautiful home. It looks very well maintained on the surface. It was built in 1925, but it looks very ma well maintained. It's been remodeled, new kitchen, bathrooms, bedroom. It's just gorgeous. Um, so I go into it and then underneath they might find that there's work that needs to be done underneath or it's got knob and tube wiring or fruit rats have eaten out all the wiring in this attic like all of these things can go on what this contract does is it says that the seller is willing to make repairs up to the repair limit so let's just use for instance uh, for instance this two thousand dollar repair limit that mr eric wilson i'm assuming you were talking about mr eric wilson uh, okay. 
um, Mr. Eric Wilson brought to you. So let's just use a $2,000 limit. So we get into a contract, we got a $2,000 repair limit for general repair items. And um, we find out that it's $14,000 in estimates for general repair items and another five grand for WDO. Let's just use that for example. At that point in time, the seller has the right to say, yes, I will make all the repairs by appropriately licensed person and pull the permits where needed and get the home up to the condition that the buyer thought it was in when they first stepped foot into it. And that's the key is that I hear a lot of realtors say, well, if there are all those issues, why would the buyer still want it? Because the seller is going to eliminate all of those issues. Mm -hmm. And so it's the house they fell in love with now even better. So why wouldn't you want to go this route? Yeah, I like it. I like that explanation because it is, you know, this, this young lady, you know, it was underpinning that needed doing and, and, what, what a fantastic, you know, if she'd have gone on an as-is contract, she would have bought that house without knowing about, because I bet you, you know, Uncle Bill would have come around and done the inspection or she would have got someone other than the great inspector that found these issues. And a year later, her house is starting to slide into the harbor and she's, but now it's all been fixed. Well, good thing we don't have a harbor here. <laughs> it's got a bay or something. There was that big bay. Oh, it was a toilet bowl during Irma. So, <laughs> all right. So let's look into this. Let's talk about what general repair items are, Murray, so that people understand what we're talking about. And guys, as we're going through this, just like Rhonda has been commenting in Facebook and you, uh, Barb, I love what you put into uh, the comments. Uh, Deanne from Rock Holland says that she knows a great home inspector. Love that, Deanne. Uh, so let's look at what um, is identified as general repair items. Oh, you have a, another sheet you want me to pull up. Let me do another share screen. Well, I can take another bright bite of my Brussels sprout casserole. Is that what you're doing over there? Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> I'll talk while you chew. All right. So we got general repair items, and this is from um, line 277 of the uh, standard sales and purchase agreement. And so um, are the following items free of leaks, water, or structural damage? And so this is gonna be your ceiling, roof, exterior, interior walls, doors, windows, and foundations. So what I like to say regarding general repair um, items, Murray, is it's essentially your structural, electrical, plumbing, um, mechanical components of the home must be in working condition. And that to me is the easiest way to summarize it but guys, as real estate sales professionals, you need to read all of these items that are in general repair items and know them. Because when you have a buyer, those are the items that per the contract can be repaired by the seller. Or if you're on the listing side and somebody starts asking you for asinine repair items, you can say, no, that it's not within the general repair items. So the seller doesn't have to do those. What yeah. more do you have on this right here, Murray? Yeah, just the, um, I like uh, to give this to the inspector as well. You know, when, when the inspector, uh, and I love the inspector, I see we have an inspector on here, um, but I, I love inspectors, uh, but, <laughs> I love them, but, um, you know, they, they want to do, they're in the customer service business, so they want to make sure that the, the buyer is getting the value for money, but it doesn't do the buyer any good to get a list of items that, you know, there's a, there's a thing on the hot water heater that every inspector seems to mention, but it's never going to get fixed. It's never going to be replaced. So, um, you know, don't mention it. You can talk about it in a separate report, but we want this standard uh, general repair inspection to just be a report about this and then keep the nonsense stuff the cosmetic and the um non issues in a separate report um so that the, the buyer has that handy for their do-it-yourself list later on in their purchase but we don't want to cloud the the we don't want to make this unclear um so the, the, in this packet there is a handout like this to give to the inspector so that they can focus and most inspectors do know about this but we because when every time the market's hot we get a lot of new inspectors jump on the bandwagon so um you've got to educate them as well 
So um, Murray, it says torn screens, including pool and patio. Does the seller need to repair or replace any of them? No. Does the seller need to repair or replace any of the following items? Yes, they do. Okay, but here's the, here, so here, here's my um, gray area thinking. As part of the general repair items, it says that the seller has to replace torn screens, but it doesn't say anything about missing them. Exactly right. So if there's no screen, then... <laughs> so if the screen yeah. is torn, just take that darn thing down and you're good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there's no requirement to have screens. And there may be some requirement in, um, you know, certain types of loans. They need to have screens in some window. And, and I'm not really up to speed on that, but I've, ha I've heard uh, agents saying, oh, no, this is a VA or an FHA loan, and we need to have a screen. Is that correct? Yeah, really? Ken Jones is on here and said, if oh. it's a VA, yes. <laughs> so thanks, Ken. He must have just had that experience. <laughs> Yeah, so um, it's very important, guys, that you read uh, lines 269 through 308, discussing uh, what a general repair item is, what the property condition should be, and how the repairs are done. Now, how the repairs are done and how they're requested to be done are oftentimes very confusing. So, Murray, this is where we typically get the majority of the questions. Um, so let's walk through the scenario. You got a buyer, you're using the standard sales and purchase agreement. Let's say that you have $5,000 um, for general repair items. And just to let you guys know, if you have 5,000 for general repair, 5,000 for WDO and 5,000 for permanent, the seller might be out of pocket 15 grand. You can do 5,000 for general repair, 2,000 for WDO and 1,000 for permit. So you can change that amount or it can be, as Murray mentioned, um, a percentage. So, okay, I've got a buyer. We've done our home inspection. It's a 15 day home inspection. It's day eight. We've got our home inspection back and we deliver a notice to the seller of specific items that we want to be repaired. What happens? You asking me? I keep forgetting that you're asking me a question. <laughs> Sorry. It's called interactive, Murray. Sorry, I was, I was thinking, oh, she's asking a question. Just say that one more time, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you need a cup of tea? <laughs> no, no, I had too many. <laughs> Maybe somebody will hear this and bring me a cup of coffee. Um, so, okay, well, hold on. I better put my coffee pot out in case somebody well, actually... Someone, someone just walked through my office, which distracted me, so... Oh, okay, okay. It wasn't the dog, it must have been your wife. Okay, so we've got three... Um, okay, so we got, we, okay, I've got the buyer. Yep. We got five thousand dollars towards repair. Yep. Our, it's a fifteen day inspection period. It's day eight. We've gotten our repairs back, and we've delivered notice to the seller of the repairs that we want to be completed. What okay. happens now? Okay, so I'm glad you said in writing. So the requirement is the buyer gives the seller their required list for general repair items within the inspection period. And then unlike the as-is contract, the clock stops. The clock stops dead on that date. And then another clock starts. And the other clock says that the seller, and this is where most agents mess up. Uh, and not so much the agent, but the seller messes up. The seller must then go and get written estimates from licensed contractors in the field in which the item that needs repair is in. They could, um, and the problem and where the seller messes up is where they suddenly will come back and they will say, I've already fixed these things. You know, once after the inspection was done, they started to, they heard the inspector say that the GFI wasn't working in the kitchen and they've just gone ahead and got it fixed. Just tell your seller to call their heels until they get the written request back from the buyer. So there's a, and, and this might sound odd, but every other item in the contract, other than the ones that are requested to be repaired, have to be in there as is condition. Now, I don't think for one moment that a GFI, the buyer's gonna take them to court because the GFI was fixed and wasn't broken into its as is condition, but you can take it to um, 
other things where people patch holes in walls. And I have, you know, Friday is my busiest day of the week uh, for calls. And the, the reason is, is normally because of what's being taken out of the property at closing and what's staying. And the, that, that's all the transactions that close today. And sometimes I think we have about 250 closings across, uh, across the companies today. It will be about nail holes and the, the buyer or the seller has fixed something where they weren't asked to fix it. And we've now got this big white streak on the wall, which the seller, which the buyer could have got fixed easily and more professionally themselves. Anyway, I haven't said that. So tell your seller not to do anything until they receive the- Now let's go on for a minute because you add, threw in some additional information on here, but I'm, I want to make sure that everybody understands the streamlined process. So even though we might have a 15 day inspection period, we got our inspections done and we presented the um, repair request on day eight. That oh, was yeah. the seller. So the inspection time frame ends. So make sure you've done well, all of the inspections you need. Yeah, well, you, your inspection time frame ends for the general repairs and you can then deliver your notice. But your permit inspection will still be running and your WDO will still be running until you deliver the written requests for those as well. So it's very good practice to get everything in hand before you ask for the repairs within the inspection period, because it may be um, if, if there's zero needs doing on the WDO, it gives you a little bit more uh, the, as a seller, it gives them a little bit more relief when they find out that, you know, hey, we may have to go up a few dollars um, on the general repairs, but hey, I, you know, I don't have any WDO and I don't have any permit problems. Right. Okay. So going back just to general repairs, the, the general repair inspection timeframe at that point ends, I give the information over to the seller and the seller at that point has to start getting estimates and the estimates that he gets for the work repairs um, if the, if he gets estimates in that exceed the repair limit, what are his options? Well, so let's say uh, they ask for 2000 in repairs. I like numbers and it comes back at 3000. So the where well, he comes back to the buyer and he says, look, the estimates came in at 3000 to repair all the things that you asked for. He has some options at that stage. The first option, which is always the one that would be nice, is that he says, but never mind, Mrs. Mrs. Buyer, I'm going to take care of that other thousand as well. We like you. Or he can say, pick the repairs you want out of your list that total 2,000. And you accept the rest in their as-is condition. Or if neither of those are agreed to, both parties in writing may cancel the contract. So if you can't get agreement on an overage, then either party can cancel the contract. Now, if they're under the repair limit, the seller can then go ahead and make the repairs with the licensed contractor, blah, de, blah, de, blah. Okay, so, we're, so we'll run back through that to make sure everybody got it. I don't, the, I'm the buyer, I deliver the addendum requesting, ins, uh, inspe, uh, sorry, repairs of the general repair items. The seller receives it. They have 10 days to get their estimates done and determine if the cost of repair is within the repair limit or exceeds the repair limit. If the cost of those repairs are within the repair limit, then the seller moves forward and makes the repairs by an appropriately licensed person. If the cost of repairs from the estimates that the seller received exceed the repair limit, he can do one of two things. He can agree to do the amount in excess of the repair limit, or he can go back to the buyer and say, um, the repairs that you've requested exceeded the repair limit. What repairs would you like me to make within the repair limit? And can we agree on that? Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So let's say that he goes, I feel like I'm um, playing, uh, I used to read these books when I was a little kid where you would, um, which chapter you went to was based off of which, how you answered the end of the chapter. So it's like, pew, pew, pew. This is how this conversation feels. <laughs> so, uh, so, so he, let's say that the cost of repairs exceed the repair limit and the seller goes back to the buyer and says, okay, the cost of repairs exceed the repair limit which of these items do you want me to repair up to 
the repair limit and not to exceed it. And at that point, what can the buyer do? So if, if the, if, if the, you know, right now, if, if the, if they exceed, I'm, I'm going to try and say this without being confusing. So if they exceed the repair limit, and the seller isn't willing to do it, the buyer may deliver notice that they are canceling the contract. Okay, and if the buyer, if the buyer doesn't make such notice, then they, the, the, the seller may, at that stage, cancel the contract if they're not going to do it. Okay, so, and there's a time frame on that, it's five days, is that right? I think it's five days, yeah. Yeah, it's and in the contract. There's, I've never had this happen, um, and, and I don't know why. I most probably will happen now. But there is a provision if they can't agree to have a third in, or second inspection done, and then there's a provision to have a third inspection done if they can't agree to the second one. So yeah. uh, I, it, it never it's never happened in the history of Murray, um, but I'm sure I'm sure now it will. <laughs> no, uh, so. You know what I love about this, Murray is because it's taken us about nine minutes just to go through that one process and, and to try to discuss it and inform people of how the process works. And this here lies the issue of why people don't use this contract. <laughs> it can be confusing until you study it and you have a really good grasp of it, right? Yeah, and I think the, you know, the, the packet that you're gonna get, um, my gift to you, the world is um, will help you understand it a little bit more. It's going to take it'll take you through it step by step from the different positions, and it isn't that hard. It, it, it sounds it, but it is a fairly simple thing as long as everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing, and by telling them what they're going to be doing makes your life a lot easier. Well, Rhonda agreed with me that it does sound confusing, and I know it sounds confusing, guys. But we're going to try to make it as simplified as possible uh, for you, and I know that Murray's packet will help. Um, my front desk was test texting me just a few minutes ago and was like, your inbox is blowing up with <laughs> testing the package. <laughs> and it's funny because since I have my phone doing the live version for Facebook, it's like ding, 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 ding. So everybody's requesting the packet, which means thank you, Murray, for providing us all with such great value. So just so that we can walk back through this and simplify it as easily as possible. Okay. You, have, you have a repair limit. It's five, we're gonna, for example, $5,000. The buyer has 15 days to do their inspection. The Ooh. buyer has completed their general repair inspection within eight days, and they deliver notice over to the seller with the items they're requesting to be repaired that fall within that general repair um, section. At that point, your general repair inspection period ends, and the ball is now in the seller's court. The seller takes the addendum of the items that you're requesting to be repaired and gets estimates for that work to be done from appropriately licensed persons. Once he receives all of those estimates back, he then calculates, is this exceeding the repair limit or is it under the repair limit? If it's exceeding the repair limit, at that point in time, the seller has two options. He can agree to do the repairs above and beyond the repair limit or he can go back to the buyer and say, the cost to repair exceeds the repair limit. I'm willing to do repair this, this, and this repair up to the repair limit, or which ones would you want me to do up to the repair limit? The buyer can agree that the seller is going to do only the repairs up to the repair limit, or at that point, they could cancel the contract. Now, I think I did a pretty darn good job streamlining, simplifying that process, the best that my brain could function. You guys, give me, give me a rating of one to 10. Was it a 10, a seven? Could I do it better? Donna says it makes sense. Donna, which Donna are you and what's the last name? Oh, I got a 9.9 .9 from Barb Daggins. <laughs> that was good. Uh, yeah. That was difficult to do. Yeah, I'm just gonna, uh, I just noticed in, when I was looking at my, uh, I read these things a thousand times and stuck them through spell check and I just noticed on the bottom of the notice to co-broke just uh, there's a uh, it should say party and not part because it's a real word spell check didn't pick it up I missed the y off of part so it should be party party not party, party. That, you, did that, you actually did that really, really, really well. 
not to be confused with potty. I, it's a very party. English way of saying party. A party. <laughs> <laughs> and then the more you party, the more American you become as you say it. Hey, um, Murray, if you're an American in the living room, what are you in the bathroom? I don't know. European. <laughs> 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 now, for anybody who knows me, I cannot teach a class or stay serious for an extreme amount of time. So we're 55 minutes in. I haven't been serious the whole time, but I always have. <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, you guys can rate my joke on a one, scale of one to ten as well. <laughs> All right. So, so Murray, that same pro. <laughs> Murray gave me a one for my. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are too much. All right. Well, thanks for making me laugh. Thanks, Barb. All right. So, um, so Murray, that same process of walking through for general repair items also works the exact same for WDO, wood destroying organisms, and also the permit piece. Yeah. Right? Okay. Exactly. Okay. So, what what questions do you guys have on this? So just throw out your questions about that piece of it, the inspection, the repair limits, how they get done, how they're decided to be done. And with that, I'm, I'm, as you're typing in your questions, I'm going to ask you, um, or I, I want to just throw this out there. Now, let's say that you're working for the seller and you're using a standard sales and purchase agreement. And this has happened, Murray. We've actually seen this take place where the buyer got their inspection done, and then sent over, sent over a cancellation and release of contract. Yeah. So, um, fly. Um, you know, they're, they're in breach of the terms of the contract uh, if they don't go through the process. So right. they've got to go through the process. I, yeah, I just wanna make sure you guys heard that. So the buyer cannot just cancel the contract based off of their inspection. They, the buyer has to go through the process of giving the addendum the repair request over to the seller and allowing the seller to go through the process of getting the estimates. Barb Dagen said, um, if repair estimates are over limit, can the buyer get their own estimates? And I believe that was, that's in the contract as like a step two, is that correct? No. Um, so let's, let's just, I th I'm not sure I understand the question. So I'm going to, I'm going to just start answering what I think it is. Um, so, if they come in over the limit and the seller will not repair, there is a opportunity for another inspection to take place. Um, and I'm going to read it because the, it, the way it's worded is very, I don't know if we, let me read it because it's very complex. Um, I can't even find it now. And it, it, it has so really, I, don't, I can't even remember a time when it's happened. Well, I think, I think what I'm, where I was going is the, the buyer can actually, I'm um, sorry, the buyer can do their um, inspection. The seller can do an inspection as well. Um, if the repair costs exceed the, uh, if the repair estimates exceed the repair limit, the reason the buyer is not getting estimates is because they're not paying for the work to be done. Right. The seller is so, paying. Yeah, the, the buyer can't get their estimates. The buyer, the seller can have their own inspection done to check the buyer's estimates. But I, there's no provision for the buyer to get their person to get in to do estimates. It's just... And Nicolay says um, that seller getting estimates for repairs can be tricky. And so I'm just curious, what do you mean by tricky? What makes it tricky for the seller to get repairs? Now, if this is a seller that's out of state or, you know, out of the country, again, this would be an example of when you would want to use as is contract because the seller's not here to get estimates and, and oversee the work to be done. But these are, but you have to take that into, into consideration, even on an on a as is contract. If the seller's not here to get estimates and get the work done, you need to set that expectation up front with the buyer's agent when they send over an as is contract. One of the things that I always recommend, um, whether you're on the buyer side or the listing side, is to ask the question of the agent who's presenting the as-is offer. How do you negotiate as-is? Or how do you handle as-is 
um, agreements because they might tell you, well, we're going to go in and do inspections and then we're going to want to renegotiate based off of inspections. So and I, I'm going to kick you off the roof if you do that. Yeah. I, I, I saw um, Bob, uh, Doreen said, you know, what about buyer doing their repairs? That's always possible. You know, uh, I just sold a, a, a property of ours and, or we sold a property, and we asked for a standard form contract. And, and, and what I did was, look, you, you, they asked for 1500, here's your 1500, go away. You know, I'm not gonna do the repairs, you can get them done if you want. We didn't, they didn't, they gave us a very few repairs. Um, I mean, most of them didn't even come up to the 15. So what, we'd already been prepared to have that happen. So that's always a possibility. So if the buyer said, I'd really want to do the repairs myself, that's great. If you want to take the money instead, that can be perfectly negotiated. Yeah, and, and Doreen, to your point, if buyers don't want to do the repairs, that's what the sellers are there for. And a lot of time, buy, a lot of times buyers don't want to do the repairs. They're moving in from out of state. They have kids. They got busy jobs, busy lives, kids going back to school, whatever. Buyers don't want to do the repairs. So that's another reason why this contract can come in handy. Rhonda asked a question. I think you might have just answered it. It said, could the buyers elect for the cash credit and do the repairs? You know, I think that what I would recommend if I were in those shoes would, would be to say, um, these are the items that fall within the general repair I, uh, list that the buyers are requesting to be repaired or they, could, they would accept the $5,000 or whatever arbitrary amount it is um, and, um, instead of the seller doing the repairs. So this is, a, you know, what I love about this is we're turning this contract, we're using this contract and, and implementing the negotiation strategies that so many people love to do with the as-is contract, and they're not, their buyers and their sellers are not protected with the as-is. Their buyer and their seller is protected with the standard. They are protected with the standard, and they're still able to use these same negotiation strategies. So there's just so many more options available for the customer when we use this contract. Uh, Doreen, I think also there was talk there about the five or 10 days. So let's just be clear on the timelines. It, once you give your written request for repairs to the seller, they have 10 days in which to get the estimates. Within five days of their last written estimate receipt, that's when the negotiation has to be all completed by. Yeah, so that's lines 300 to 303 in the contract. Just, okay, 300 to 303. Uh, just to clarify that, so, so the seller has 10 days to get their estimates. Let's say they get their estimates and they send those estimates to the buyer on day eight. That's when the five-day period starts for the, for the buyer to um, accept the <laughs> estimates and have the seller go ahead and move forward. Right, so I'm going to read it so it's clear. If, if cost to repair general repair items equals or is less than general repair, the seller goes ahead and gets it done. So the five days comes into effect now. If cost to repair exceeds the general repair limit, then within five days after the party's receipt of the last estimate, seller can elect to pay the excess, et cetera, by delivering written notice, or um, buyer may deliver written notice saying which ones they want done, and then, or, if they neither deliver such written notice, then parties have the right to terminate the contract. So that's that where that five days comes in. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, any other questions on that? We've got our front desk here uh, saying that if you don't have access to our closed Facebook pages, we are trying to put this out on our open Facebook pages um, for you guys to have access to the packet. If you've already emailed me, front desk is checking my email and probably already sending those over to you. So we'll get those to you shortly. How many of you guys are thoroughly confused? <laughs> me, I am. Clear as mud, right? And that's how we do this, Murray. You know, I know that people talk about Keller Williams being a training company, and we are. For, for really smart people who continually need training and growth and sharpen their skills, I love that so many people are in our Zoom room and watching us on Facebook because what that says to me is we that these people in here are extremely smart and they know that education 
doesn't stop. You have to continually learn how to be better and to sharpen your skill set so that we are doing the best for our consumer. Uh, Jordan, and, and I'm eye candy. You are eye candy. Everybody says so. <laughs> I heard background, background noise then. One thing I want to talk about um, before we move on is the listing, the listing appointment. Um, is that something that we can talk about? Or how we can talk about that? Of course, you want me to pull that one up too? Hmm? You want me to pull that one up? No, okay. just, I just want to talk about you know, what happens at the listing appointment when you're talking about the two types of contracts. Okay, while you talk about that, I'm gonna go grab some more water. Is that okay? You took a bite of your broccoli casserole. I'm gonna get some more water. Uh, it's Russell Sprouts. Oh, I, I apologize. Um, this is really weird looking at an empty chair. Hey, so on the listing appointment, and, and this is when, when the conversation with the seller will happen about these two types of um, contracts. And the, you're going to sit down with the seller, and, and I, I feel, and, and I'm not a salesperson, I don't ever profess to be, but I feel if a realtor came into my house and to present me with a listing appointment, a package and said, look, I want to list your home. I'd be fairly impressed about balloons on my mailbox and open houses, but I'd be really, really impressed if they told me about the two types of contracts and how it would protect me as a seller that this is where your limit is going to be. So I'd be thinking about things like, well, I've got a grand that I'm prepared to put into this place to fix it up uh, before we sell it. Okay, so we now know that, that we've got that $1,000. That If we do use the standard contract, they will be looking at, at countering the buyer with 1000 in general repairs. So it, it, it gives you an edge, and especially in multiple uh, office, sorry, multiple listing appointment situations where the seller is interviewing lots of different agents, I'd be inclined to try and pull out all the stops to get that listing and I think it's another string to your bow that if you're you're talking about the actual mechanics of the transaction and I, I don't think we do that I've been on a few listing appointments over the years just to tr uh, shadow someone my wife is an agent and I've heard her do listing appointments um, but I think you know it you see them especially the engineers and the um, <laughs> you thought a string to my bow was funny. Okay, Kristen. Um, but I think the seller, you see them sit up, the engineers, uh, uh, the sort of CS types, they sit up in their chair and start listening when you start talking about the, the, the actual mechanics of the contract. That's of interest to them rather than the actual, uh, you know, balloons on the mailbox conversations. And we all, you know, they work, open houses and flyers work, but you're, you're, you're bringing another level of professionalism to your listing appointment. And then as you walk the house with the seller, um, I, I, again, I've never done it, but I would think it would be a good time to bring with you a, a yellow sticky pad and just mark some of the items that you see that could be a problem in an inspection. And maybe they want to get those fixed ahead of the inspection rather than have to go through that nonsense once they list it. My house inspector that I use for my personal purchases and stuff, he does what is, and I'm sure a lot of your inspectors do it, they do an, a pre-inspection for the seller. So the seller is going to know exactly what they're going into prior to getting the house on the market. And so talk to your inspector about whether they do that. Also talk to the, the seller about having a home warranty um, whilst they're uh, listed. They can have a seller's warranty. So anyway, as you're walking through the property with your yellow sticky pad, you could, it's a good opportunity for you to talk to them about the what is staying and what is going uh, so that we don't have closing day arguments about what was written on page one, you know, refrigerators in the garage, uh, mirrors in the bathroom, and wheelie countertops that people are buying from that horrific organization, IKEA, that causes me pro more problems on a Friday. IKEA's the devil, you know. They have these butcher's tables that have wheels on them that look like they're part of a kitchen, but they're not. They are parcel oh. property. 
Oh, I love that one. Sorry, get ex- I get excited about contracts, as you guys can <laughs> tell. Um, so on the first page of the, pro- uh, this is one of the first lessons I learned as a, uh, a managing broker. Um, so on the first page of the contract, page one of 13, line 15, personal property, unless excluded in paragraph one or by other terms of this contract, the following items, which are owned by the seller, and it should be in capital letters, and existing on the property as of the date of the initial offer. So my first learning lesson on this was, um, it was a condo at Park Shore Plaza, and um, it was tenant occupied. So anytime a a property is tenant occupied, you need to make sure um, that you understand what is owned by the seller and what is owned by the tenant and what is staying and what is not staying. So um, in this in this luxury condo, it was a million dollar property, um, the, um, the drapes in the master bedroom were owned by the tenant, not by the seller. So the walkthrough, we get ready for the walkthrough and um, there are blinds in the room, all the rooms, except in the master bedroom, the drapes are missing and the buyer's having a fit. And so my learning lesson was since they were owned by the tenant, they didn't stay with the property. So you guys need to make sure of that. Now I remember Miss Jennifer Orns had another transaction sitting at the closing table, called me the um the buyer she represented the seller the buyer wanted a dishwasher the property had never had a dishwasher it wasn't one that had been removed there was never a hookup for a dishwasher but in the mls it had mistaken or no it wasn't even in the mls i think it was in the property disclosure they mistakenly checked the box of dishwasher so the buyer's agent and the buyer was adamant that they wanted a credit of like $2,500 $2,500 or something to put a new dishwasher in. Do you, did Jennifer ever tell you about this story, Murray? Yeah, I've heard it. And uh, it, it, yeah, you're right. People are crazy. So we had to stand firm that, and yeah. first of all, the listing, the, sorry, the MLS nor the property disclosure is part of the agreement between the buyer and the seller. Only the things that are agreed to in, in this agreement between the buyer and seller are legally binding. Um, the MLS, the property disclosure, the home inspection, the appraisal, none of those are actually part of the agreement between the buyer and the seller. So in the end, we just had to stand firm and the, um, the buyer, of course, didn't get a dishwasher because it wasn't part of the agreement, never existed on the property. Yeah. Do you, the, uh, I always, and I just saw Bob uh, right there that she paid for a washer and dryer. I, I literally, uh, I, I would say, a month, it used to be a week, but I think we've trained a lot of agents now, but a month doesn't go by where I don't deal with a washer and dryer incident on a Friday. And it's, <laughs> I, had one, I had one last week. And you know what was really sad? You know, I, I, I tell my agents that I work for that I will never go to bat for you if you're wrong. I'm never ever going to call another broker up and beg and plead and say that you did something wrong. Can you forgive us and leave the washer and dryer? I'm not going to say that. It's not going to happen. But this broker called me, bless his heart, and I love him. He's a friend of mine. And he said, you know, they took the washer and dryer. So I said, yeah, it wasn't in the contract. And she said, they said, well, you know, they were expecting the washer and dryer. Well, it wasn't in the contract. Well, it was in the MLS. It wasn't in the contract. Now, I said to him, what happened if that washer and dryer was stinky, dirty, and the buyer didn't want it, and we left it there? How would that call go? Would I be able to say to you, well, we said it was in the MLS. So, and, and finally, but I, I just can't believe that, that, you know, the guy's been around for 30 years. I would not, I would not make that call. If you, for, if you forgot to put the washer and dryer in the contract, then shame on you. You're going to buy one. That's yeah, Appliance Direct exists because of realtors. You know, Doreen has a great business idea for you. Open up an appliance store. Open up an appliance store. Wacky Nunu. You could just have it open on Friday afternoon through Sunday. 
<laughs> and you can, I could have, actually, I could personalize it with your business card. So whenever they do laundry, you're front of mind. Yeah, there you go. Hey, um, you're front of mind. I gotcha. So um, Rhonda says, what about uh, wall-mounted TVs attached now? Do they stay? Um, oh, we got onto this. Uh, well, uh, there's, there's not been any, there's never been any court tested cases on wall-mounted TVs. The bracket itself is likely to be real property. Uh, the television that's hanging on it, the, the, the cases I've read in lower courts have talked about the fact that it's like artwork. You wouldn't expect your, a photo of the mother-in-law to stay with the house, so why would you expect the television to stay there? Um, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I, but then, then what I say to an answer to that is just, just get clarity right up front. So if it's any doubt as to whether it's real or personal property, make sure it's clear in the contract that the um, big screen television that's fixed to the wall in the man cave will not stay with the with the property at sale. Or and, if you're uh, on the buyer side, you write that it will. But either way, as clarity is power, clear is kind. Uh, I'm clear is kind. Uh, and so can I, I, I just, I just want to answer Nic uh, Nikolai. Um, if we put as per MLS of the effective date, is it binded on line on paragraph 20? No, um, don't do that. And the reason we don't do that is because MLS isn't, um, doesn't want two reasons. It's the same as the seller's real property disclosure. The seller's real property disclosure clearly states on there, this is not to be made part of the contract. And I can't recall ever seeing that an MLS sheet can't be made part of the contract. But it, it, for the same reasons, it's, it, there's no clarity. There's, if you see a picture of um, a refrigerator in the MLS, is that going to be the same refrigerator that's there on closing day? We'll never know. So if that's important to your buyer that they definitely want to keep that, that refrigerator that was there, then use the serial number. Take your own photographs. But it's, it's dangerous to bring in something in the MLS because it could actually be changed prior to to the closing date as well. They could switch both of them, they could do anything. Well, uh, when I got up to grab some more water, I was so pleased. We have four agents, uh, three of which you talk to on a regular basis, I'm sure. So Donna Knight, Aaron Hoffman, and Eric Wilson, and Michael Thompson are all in our training room because we have the TVs going with the uh, contract class up. And they were having a full on mastermind. Yeah, wave hi to them. They're having a full on mastermind. I asked them to type their question into the, in the chat box, but they're just writing them down. So I did pull one of the questions out of them. And so going back to what we were talking about with general repair items and giving the buyer giving that list over to the seller for estimates um let's say that the buyer and the seller agree that the seller will give them a, the amount or any amount instead of doing the repairs this is going to be written up as an addendum to the contract so what would you recommend being part of that addendum well you're going to use the word lou um it's very uh, it, it's a uh, a French word and we don't use it that often but you're going to use the word loose so what you're going to say is that uh, the, the seller will contribute five thousand dollars to the buyer in lieu of the repairs in paragraph 12 a b and c so we want because what we don't want to happen is then to get the money and still come back later on and and, and talk about the repairs so it's in replace replacing the repairs we're taking the money so now i'm going to throw out another um obstacle at you what's the lender going to say when he sees that who the lender ah so that's a good question um so the lender doesn't need to see anything except <laughs> with fha and va so there's no obligation for um, the parties of a contract to give any agreements to the lender regarding repairs if it's a conventional loan. Obviously, well, it's a... Well, hold on. Question. So that's an amount of money which can be considered a seller concession. If the seller's already conceding some money, wouldn't that exceed... It could potentially exceed the amount of seller concessions allowed for by the lender which could be following that mortgage fraud right. realm. 
I, I agree. So, so to, you know, what, what, when someone calls me and asks me this, I say, talk to the lender. First off, talk to the lender, find out how much you can give for a start. And then if you can give that amount, talk to the, what type of loan is it? If it's FHA or VA, then that, that document has to go to the lender, has to be made part of their packet. If it's conventional, you, with a standard contract, the, the, with a standard contract anyway, the lender's gonna know there's gonna be repairs because it's got it right in there that we're gonna be asking for repairs. So it shouldn't be a shock to them. And they need to make, but we do need to make sure that they can take the cash uh, as at the closing table that it's not going to affect their whatever it's called the loan to value okay and thank you for that and then i, I love that you said call the lender because the lender is your business partner in this um and so um brad boner asked if you would repeat that and i was going to type it in so the seller will give blank amount in lieu of repairs as per paragraph 12 a b and c Repairs, WDL, and permits. So, and um, and you spelt no, you spelt Lou wrong. I know it's it's L -E it never comes up. L -E, -E. L I E U, yeah. L I E U. There we go. I knew it was wrong. I just couldn't. couldn't there you go. Um, question. I'm just checking my phone here. Crazy people. People are doing real estate on a Friday. Who the thunk? Uh, one other thing you need to talk about at your listing agree, uh, appointment is, um, you know, uh, and also with your buyer is the amounts. I think it's, there's some tactics, that, and I talked to Jen about this um, over the years. There's tactics that you can employ as a buyer's agent where you pretty much know the chances of having put, uh, WD, sorry, as a listener, you know that the, the place is free of WDO. There isn't any problems with WDO. So when you do your counter on price, you can always, and you know there's no permit problems. When you do your counter on the repairs, you can just bring down the general repair counter and leave the other two high. And that has a psychological effect on the buyer thinking, oh, well, you know, I've still got this money. But you can't add, and what people try and do is they try and add all three together and put it into general repairs when they find there's nothing on, on permits. And can't, WPR. can't do that. Can't do that. Um, yeah. Thompson says, can we also discuss the fine line of general repairs and what constitutes the need for repair itself? So that goes yeah. back, um, Thompson, I'm not sure if you were in um, on the conversation in the beginning. There is a packet that we're going to provide you guys. So that's going to be your paragraph 12a that discusses general repair items and what i'm sorry that's not uh yeah sorry it's paragraph 12b line 269 and mari has it all detailed out and i can probably i can probably pull that back up um so these yeah. are going to be the items that constitute a general repair item and the terminology used in the contract says that it has to be in working condition so yeah. Here's a here's a um, one for you, Murray. I get an AC AC guy comes out. AC works. It's 16 years old. It's still op operating, but it's not cooling to the point where it should be. Yeah, that that's not operating in the manner in which the item was designed to operate. Same with pool pumps. Well, whiny pool pumps. You know, you go the pool equipment's making a noise, and and I've had sellers come back and say, well, that's not broken it works it's 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 yeah it works but it's not supposed to sound like that and so it's not operating in the manner in which it was designed right so all of this all of this guys goes into you said psychological well ago which brings up you know there's a lot of psychological aspect of contract negotiating and you know i'm saying study the contract but i also recommend studying behavioral styles is key uh, you, there's a book out emotional intelligence 2.0 or something reading that book and understanding people's emotions and how they operate is essential um because you're not you can't just show up as you you won't get the results you want when you're just trying to be you you have to be able to read the buyer the seller and the other agent so that you are able to help everybody get what they want because once you have achieved that you're first of all working as a transaction agent which is your obligation 
um, and you're creating a win-win. So, um, you know, if we just went in and just hard-fisted and this is what I want, uh, it's not going to get us anywhere. But having things in our pocket, like knowing the difference between the contracts, uh, talking to the buyer about accepting a credit versus making the seller do all the repairs, or talking to the buyer about having the seller make repairs um, and stay in the contract, bringing up home warranty, all of these are things that will help um, the buyer get the home they want and the seller to sell it. it. There was a question Brad asked just a while ago. He said, any suggestions on how to best approach a multiple offer situation, how to be aggressive yet still have general repairs? Brad, that's a great question. We brought that up in the very beginning. In the packet that Murray has, he actually has a document that you can send over with the standard contract. And we're finding that um, more and more agents are becoming aware of using the standard contract and how to, so it's not as scary. The listing agent, as a listing agent, especially in a multiple offer situation, I would think that you would want to receive a standard contract. Yeah. That's one that says the buyer is sticking around. As soon as you get that as is, it's like, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna fly as soon as they can. Um, and so it's just the way, how can we present that where we're not making the listing agent feel like an idiot for only wanting as is? You know, and that's a, a fantastic uh, segue because last weekend we had a, um, a, a multiple offer, 34 offers, and the agent called and said, no, what do I do? So, you know, my, how do I sort these? You know, what, do I, what advice do I give the seller? And I said, well, look, you've got to give them options. We've got to look, we're going to look at them all see what's in there but here's some pointers we'll pull out the standard contracts one it tells you two things the realtor knows what the heck they're doing and you you haven't got a weekend um you know mary Kay realtor going on hey, hey. hey. <laughs> Boom. and then you've got a no you've got someone that actually knows what they're doing they're not playing at it and we need we need to have educated people in the transaction Two, um, they're in it to win it, as you said. They're not going to just, you know, win, put the most amount of money down and then try and beat them down during the inspection period. I love Mary Kay, Kristen. I love them, Mike. <laughs> That's why I got on to him, Kristen. I knew you were on here. <laughs> my cousin, my cousin is a director or something. She drives a pink something up on in Virginia Beach. So should be a Cadillac, pink Cadillac. Okay, so just going back, so the, the agent that got 34 offers, her first name wasn't Sue, was it? Uh, I know Sue called me as well last weekend. Hers wasn't 34. No, it was one of my agents down here in Orlando. Okay, just check. Sue has a lot. Yeah, I would figure. Okay, so um, just going back to that. So you recommended that they go through all 34 and just pick out the standard contracts first and foremost because those tell you that the agent who presented the standard contract uh, they know they they have a, a higher level of knowledge when it comes to the contract and the buyer is willing to stick around they, they they're holding their feet to the fire what would be some other things you would look for uh, on a multi offer I, I would pick up the darn phone and if the lender didn't answer my phone next <laughs> you know, so here are some other things how much are they putting in escrow yeah and, and i don't even know like you know i feel kind of like discriminatory to even say what percentage are they putting down because I'm I feel so like sensitive and hard and it feels bad for all of these buyers out there who might be FHA or VA and especially VA buyers like they are veterans they protected and served our country and we're saying no you're not good enough because you're using the loan product that's a benefit to you for protecting our, our country that's um, say again I say it's a hard one to do, you know, don't. It's a hard one. So I'm going to recommend don't look at that as um, a qualifier because there are so many very good buyers out there that are trying desperately to purchase homes mm -hmm. and they're buying them FHA and VA, but that doesn't make them a bad buyer. So I would look, how much are they putting in escrow? What's their time frame? What's their inspection period? Did they use the standard contract? Who is their realtor? They mm -hmm. have has their realtor closed enough transactions to know what they're doing? Who is their lender? Is it Quicken Loan or is it, you know, Van Dyke Cross Country? <laughs> How, did you talk to their lender? 
uh, you know, these are the things that I would be looking for in a multiple offer situation. So then, therefore, these are things that I would also want to present. Uh, we talked about this, Brad. I know this was your question, so just um, I'm addressing this to you. You know, a lot of buyers can go through underwriting prior to even making an offer. So if your buyer's already gone through underwriting, have the lender write a letter that accompanies the offer. Have a buyer have the buyer write a letter accompanying the offer. Have the buyer write a or have you write a letter like Murray has one lined out in here of why you're presenting the standard agreement versus the as is so that the listing agent understands. Murray, I'm gonna uh, take a breath and say, Rhonda, you put what question mark, question mark, question mark, but I don't know what it was regarding. So if you could just tell me what that means. I bet I know. Well, she was Mary Kay. No, she, but I bet it was because you said you would take all the standard contracts out first because it meant you were dealing with a higher level agent. And she said that she only uses as is. So... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, what I mean is that if someone is, can understands the standard contract and they're comfortable with it, you actually not, you, I'm not saying pick that one, but I would have a good close look at them and talk to the seller about it and explain to them this is a great contract, that they're not going to be running away in the inspection period and they're not going to be beating you up. You're not going because you think, you think on a Saturday, uh, last Saturday, that poor, that lucky seller got 34 contracts you don't want someone canceling on Thursday and then having to go through the same thing again on the following Saturday. And what happened, you know, this world, we're now going to Jumanji level five very soon. We have no clue what's going to happen in the next five days. It could be the dinosaurs, you know, so you know, strike while the iron's hot. Get your house sold. Level five, that's a new one. I've heard apocalyptic, but not that. Hey, Rhonda was getting on to you for saying uneducated realtor using as is. She said, but I would have called the agent and qualified my offer. All right. So I love, a, I love what David Roman put in here. He said, VA buyers go to this office. Absolutely. I love that. I mean, that just makes my heart warm. I have more and more people will think that way, David. So thank you for putting that in here. Doreen said, I would look for cash as is, no contingencies. Uh, that sounds great. I've never seen one of those because the contract is, has about 47 different timelines in there and it's full of contingencies that you don't even realize are there. Yeah. So can I talk, can I just make a mention that never put no contingencies because we, there are so many contingencies that, as you said, Rachel, that are hidden in that contract. And if they take away all the contingencies, it can injure the seller. So that, that, that's something that we need to very clarify. Also, the if you have an appraisal contingency you know make the appraisal instead of saying scrap the appraisal contingency make the appraisal contingency low if that's the right way you bring the price of the appraisal contingency down because it's always a fear especially with cash buyers they're going to have their appraisal contingency and it may be you know we you may we sometimes we miss them and we don't want to get to the end of the contract and then have a fight over trying to bring the price down. Right. And, if, and I've had a lot of cash buyers knowing that the seller's not going to sue them. They're in there with a thousand dollar escrow and they'll walk on it. They'll just walk. They'll say goodbye to the thousand. And that's why when we're talking about the strength of, a, of an offer and more in the escrow is always a good thing. Uh, for as long as I can remember, you know, there, there used to be a time when people, and there's still every once in a while we'll hear this, like the realtor says, we want you to release the um, inspection contingency. No, <laughs> that's the answer to that, no. Uh, never, ever, ever write a release of the inspection contingency, and here's why. Because I've seen it way too much, buyer releases all contingencies. All of them, survey, title, liens, financing, wow. Yeah, it's like, it's just one of the worst things that you can do. So don't ask for it and don't do it. If somebody wants you to do it, say no. Are you an uneducated realtor? That's what I'm going to start saying to them, Rhonda. All right, we got some more questions in here. I think Jumanji level five, somebody else loved that. Doreen, wow, good for that seller. Okay, so I think we got all the questions out of the way. And I think we've talked about the differences of the two contracts. And it's only 133. Just want to throw this out there. Any additional questions? Like, what are you guys seeing, hearing uh, to be terrific, be specific? Any questions? What are you guys 
now sensing since we've sat through this um, between the standard agreement and the as-is agreement. Uh, oh, Murray, you know something that people always say to me? Rachel only wants me to use the standard, or I hear them say, Rachel only allows me to use the standard contract. I just went and asked an agent in the other to print me a copy of the contract, and they're like, I'm using dot loop, is that okay? I'm like, I don't care what you use, just print the contract. Um, but yeah, I don't tell you guys which contract to use. You're gonna, I want you to use the one that works best for the situation and for your customer. And here's a funny for you, Murray. Guess what contract I use when I buy homes? The as is. Only the as is. And the reason is, is because I'm buying it as yeah, is. Wow, what a concept. I'm buying it as is. Yeah. So it's as is. Yeah, we, you know, I, I, same way. You know, um, I, I would buy it if I'm not going to ask for repairs. I'm definitely, and I'm actually going to be, I, actually, the house next door to me I bought, and I just wrote in there, um, as is in the in paragraph 20, I broke all my own rules because I can do that. I put in there no, re, uh, no, repair requests will be made we're doing an inspection but there'll be no repair requests made oh, that's, that's yeah. a beautiful negotiation tip for you guys that are paying attention to this if you're in a multiple offer situation and you've already talked to your buyer about them if in that paragraph you put purchasing as is no repair request will be made that's beautiful murray golden I got a few things on my list that I'm talking. Every time I get an opportunity to talk to agents, I'm saying these things. So, um, but if I can give me just five minutes on that. Okay, and we got a couple extra questions that come in too. Uh, do you think FHA offers? Oh, hold on. Answer this one because this one gets asked all the time. Uh, Brad asks, how how necessary is the appraisal addendum? Is it already covered in the contract? Uh, actually, no, it's not, uh, Brad. And that is a common misconception. The financing contingency is not an appraisal contingency. There is a small little line in there that says that the property has to appraise to meet the financing um, conditions. Yeah, condition. yeah. Loan approval. To so meet the conditions of the loan approval. Yeah, to meet the conditions of the loan approval, but that is not a financing, uh, I'm sorry, an appraisal con uh, contingency. If your buyer is putting 20% down, 30% down, 50% down, that does not take, uh, that is not going to come into effect. And we are seeing a lot of appraisal addendums being used, and especially being used with escalation clause and multiple offer situations. Um, so yeah, I would. I mean, if you're if you're concerned about the comps, use the appraisal addendum, but it might cause the the listing agent or the seller not to pick your contract. And then uh, Doreen, I think, asked about you know if you look at the FHA rider, FHA VA rider, rider E, it actually only talks about the standard contract in there. Oh my gosh, thank you. I see Barb asked that, said that too. Yes, guys, this is a oh, big pet peeve. When you use the FHA and VA rider, it, re it references specific paragraphs in the standard contract. And when you're using the as-is contract, they're different paragraphs. Please pay attention to what you're doing. <laughs> there, oh, sorry. There have never been, there's never been an FHA inspection done that didn't request something to be repaired, correct? Right. And what that's saying is, that's an amber alert. I just... Uh, it's funny, it's, it came to Orlando a few seconds. We're far more uh, informed over here than you are. <laughs> but they tell you late. Um, so let's, uh, let's, yeah, let's just dig in a little bit to a couple of my things before, and I'll keep an eye on the questions. But th things that I'm talking about every time I get to speak to agents is one, I'm talking about uh, loan approval. P please, 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 in your addenda, and your vocabulary, get rid of the word commitment. Um, I, have a, I have quite a nasty little escrow dispute going on at the moment with Freck, actually, because it was a broker, uh, broker related, uh, kept the escrow. So we are presenting the case to Freck for us to get the escrow. And what, my, what the agents did was they extended the contract until for eight days. This is how the addendum was written. And, and I know they're not going to be on this uh, 
so I can I can talk about it. But um, my agent uh, and the the buyer's agent rather put the contract, the closing date, and the loan commitment will be extended for eight days. So my argument is that there is no such thing as loan commitment. And so we will refer, our seller was under the impression what they meant was the clear to close will be extended eight days. And uh, uh, Frecker will agree with me because there is the only time commitment is now mentioned in the contract is title commitment. Other than that, and I lost $100 the other day because I said, if you can find me the word commitment in the contract, I'll give you $100. Crap, I forgot about title commitment. Well, with speaking of words of the contract, Murray, there's another one too, um, escrow. What do title call, companies call it? Uh, deposit? What are we talking about? Yeah, but what a, it's called something else. It's called an escrow. Earnest money deposit, EMD. They call it EMDs. And I constantly see in additional terms and language of, the, uh, of agents, they're using earnest money. Guys, earnest money is never mentioned in the contract. It's called escrow deposit. And so make sure that's a So just like what you're talking about, loan commitment versus approval, knowing the language of the contract and using the language of the contract is essential. Yeah. So get rid of the words commitment. The only time that the loan will be committed is one second before that buyer signs on the dotted line in the closing table. A, a lender is never going to commit to the loan until that moment. So that's why we got rid of the word back in 2019 uh, with this new contract, uh, the June 19 contract, got rid of loan commitment. So don't say it, just get it out of your system. Just go into a room now and just shout commitment, 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 and get it out, get it I out. So many people are, are afraid of commitment, they won't use the word, so it's okay. Yeah, I was. Um, <laughs> Uh, another thing that caused me a, a problem twice recently was don't move forward with performing the contract if you still have not received one of the checked riders on the contract. What we had was the appraisal rider was checked, but it wasn't delivered. Oh. They went, moved forward and did uh, did inspections, did uh, went moved forward with the loan application, and then all of a sudden the TC re realized that the appraisal rider had not been received executed. So we have the argument then: Are we e effective or aren't we effective? Um, well, that's yeah. a, such a great one because I get asked this question all the time: If we're missing initials or if the rider wasn't delivered. Um, and the language that I've received from attorneys and legal um, prep was that if you miss an initial but all terms were agreed upon, then you still have an effective contract. And the scenario of an appraisal contingency not being seen by the seller, there's a very good chance that that term has not been agreed upon. Yeah. And but like a lead-based paint, if it's checked but not delivered, would you say that terms are agreed upon? Me? <laughs> I'm the only one you're asking questions to. I've, I've finally got there after an hour and 45 minutes. Um, I, would say, I would say, you know, that no, they're not. Um, because, you know, lead-based paints, uh, that warning is a federally required uh, form that must be given to all parties in, or to a buyer or a tenant in every transaction prior to them going into the agreement. So whether the, if there's a signature missing off it or an initial missing off it, I don't think it's fatal to the contract, but it, it'd be fatal to the agent and the uh, broker for fines if there's not on there. Okay, so I'm gonna put some holes in it. Let's, let's, let's hammer this one out. Because neither one, well, I'm not an attorney. You're not an attorney in the States. So, um, thank goodness. <laughs> so let's say that um, lead-based paint wasn't delivered, but isn't that a federal violation, not um, a term of the agreement between the buyer and the seller, but more of a federal violation of the It's agent. a disclosure. But it's on the agent to disclose it through using the contract. So it's not right. actually an agreement between the buyer and the seller. So it doesn't really affect the terms of the contract. 
And then, yeah, I, I would agree with you there, but, but, but as well, I would say it's not our fight. You know, we're, we, we're going to move forward with the contract, but it, that wouldn't be our fight. But yeah, I think if it ever did go to court, they would most probably say that we did have a valid contract because it, that isn't a term. But from, from a practical point of view and an expense point of view, I think you're looking at 16 grand uh, per month. Somewhere month. between 15 and $18,000, guys, if you don't per have yeah. It can go up to like 64 grand on the whole uh, lead based paint. And, and the one we miss the most is landlord tenant. It, it's not, you know, I've, I've done some audits in, in market centers for people, and I've, you know, we've got landlord tenants. It's a 1977 building. It's the tenant must be served the lead based paint uh, notice to tenants. I think a lot of times agents overlook that one thinking it's not that important. And I, I really love that, that you brought that up because it is a federal offense, a federal violation. And we've seen those fines range from 15 to 18,000. And just like you said, they can go all the way up to 64,000. So guys, make sure you're disclosing on lead-based paint. And then I have one last thing I want to, uh, and then I'll shut up, is um, just on multi-offer protocols. That, you know, while we're in this multi-offer market, some of, the, some of the incidents I'm seeing more prevalently is you know, you don't have to go back to all the buyers and say, hey, I want your highest and best offer. The phrase itself is, is kind of a wrong phrase. Um, I don't particularly like the phrase and I don't know why. I can't remember why, but I know at one point I formed an opinion on it. Um, it it's up to the sellers. You know, you say to the seller, do you want me to go back and ask if, if they're their highest and best offer? Okay, yeah, please do. Or you're going to get into an offer and counter offer situation. I'm getting lots of complaints because our agents aren't getting back to everyone and acknowledging receipt of the offer. It just blows my phone up on a Monday. It's a simple thing. All you need to do is just cut and paste the paragraph. I've received your offer. The, bar the seller is going to be reviewing all offers on Wednesday at five o'clock. I will get back to you then if you have the success. If, you if your offer is one of the successful. Uh, offers that will be negotiated further. And then and it, it's not that the agent, uh, it, it helps the buyer and, the, and because the buyer is beating up their agent saying, why haven't you heard anything? When are we gonna hear? Just set that expectation of when they're gonna hear and it will keep my phone from ringing and, and yours. Well, I'm, and I'm typing this into the comment field because I think it should say something more than you have received the offer. I think it should yeah, however say, you want to say, I have received the offer and delivered to the seller. Third, and, and I'll just keep talking while you're talking and typing. The um, other thing is with multi-offer is just understand offer and acceptance. You know, when you counter offer, you're rejecting the offer. A counter is a rejection of the offer. And sometimes we lose track of where that tennis ball is. So we have our offer comes in and the seller says, get back to them and tell them it's 275, not 250. So we go back to them with the 275. We're not in contract yet until that buyer accepts that 275 in writing per the statute of frauds. And you know, that, keep, it, keep it in writing. Where my complaints come is where the agent has said, yes, we have a deal. And the agent has run out into the parking lot, grabbed their buyer in a socially distant manner and hugged them. <laughs> we have a deal, we have a deal. And then two minutes later, the seller gets another better deal come in. And so they reject buyer one. And, you, and you've already done all the love and everything with the buyer. Don't, and t don't say anything to your party's celebratory until you have it signed and in your hand because the sellers can change their mind right up until that point. And, and Renee Schoenberg put up, uh, put a comment in here, use the counter offer yeah. form. And yeah. I'm just, is the counter offer form a, uh, a, a document of the actual contract? No, it, I mean, it's not, unless it's written at the time. I haven't got one. I've never used one, never seen one, to be honest. But Okay, so if you're using the counter offer form and it's not an addendum to the contract, just because the parties agreed and signed the counter offer form doesn't mean that you actually have a signed agreement of terms as part of the contract. So just take that into consideration. Right. The, the actual contract itself on page 
12 and 13 on the standard has a counter offer paragraph if you want to use that. Right. All right, Murray. I think we did a lot of edumacating. I do think we did. All right. I'm glad that finally you learned that I was asking you questions. <laughs> well, you know where I am. I've got my phone. People, how can people that are on this seminar call me while I'm on it? I'm on, the, I'm on a seminar. <laughs> Well, I have my phone too, but it's been, it's been showcasing us live on Facebook so that anybody out there could uh, watch it. And I just want to say thank you, everyone that was part of this, that participated in this, that had questions and comments. I, it's so hard to teach a class without being in a classroom, getting feedback from people, because that's really what fuels, fuels the energy. Um, and you guys did a great job fueling our energy. So thank you so much. It will be live on Radium Red, and we will also be able to get the packet out to you. Make sure you email me. I'll put my email address in here one more time. Uh, so please email me. Please do not put your email address in here. Once I close this, I will not have access to anything that you typed in here. All right, Murray. As always, I appreciate your professionalism and your knowledge, and I love having you as a business partner. And you too, darling. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Bye.